Good evening, good afternoon, everyone. I see many, many friends and colleagues connecting from all over the world. Thank you, Roma, for your very kind introduction. And thank you. I'm very grateful for this invita invitation uh, issued by uh, Dr. Abbas Emilani and uh, the, the, uh, the Center for Iranian Studies at Stanford. Uh, I have prepared a, a very short presentation uh, that focuses on my recently published book, Beholding Beauty, about Sadi Shiraz. I believe you can, you can probably see my screen. The book was, was, is, has been published by Brill uh, in December and was officially launched last week uh, through the CNES Center at UCLA. Um, it, it focused on Sadi's poetry, Sadi's lyric poetry. And, and I'm very glad to, to share again parts of, of my aspects of my research that I already shared last year, exactly one year ago, through a marvelous panel organized, a wonderful workshop organized by Professor Marie Hubert at Stanford on um, Persian and Persian poetics. So I'm very glad to be back, albeit virtually. And I will share with you a few, a few points that, that I think can, can, can help us um, discuss different aspects of, of Sadi's poetry in its historical and cultural context. Um, if you're here, most of you, you already know who Sadi was. Here I have a brief sketch of his, of his life and major works. We know very little about him. I've been relying on almost 30 uh, old manuscripts that were copied between between the end of the 13th century and the end of the 15th century uh, in order to reframe the, the biography of this poet about whom we know very little. And, and I've been trying also to rely on the same manuscripts to, to understand what kind of, um, what kind of uh, cultural, spiritual aspects can, can help us re reconfigure and re reassess the, the, the value and the meaning of his poetic production. As you can see here, this is one of the oldest manuscripts collecting the entirety of Sadi's works. It's a beautiful uh, document copied probably toward the end of the uh, 13th century. It's possible it was copied when Sadi was still um, alive or had died very recently, most likely toward in the 90s, late 90s of the 13th century, or maybe during the first decade of the, of the 14th century. So it's an interesting, it's an extremely interesting manuscript that is kept in the Academy of Science, the, 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 the library, the Academy of Science of the Republic of Tajikistan. As you can see, there is this mention here of the title, Sheikh al Aref. We'll be talking about what Sheikh means and what Aref can refer to. And here you have this beautiful sort of uh, discs that are listing the different uh, uh, titles of, of Sadi's works. What we know almost for sure that Sadi studied at the renowned Nizamiya school in Baghdad, probably in the 1230s. And he was probably at least initially loosely attached to the Suravardiya Sufi order. Um, and, and we also know that he did seek political and literary patronage throughout his entire life. The major works that that uh, made Sadi renowned in, throughout the entirety of, of uh, the Middle Ages and the modern period, both in in the Persian world, uh, bo both in the Persian-speaking world and in the West, are the so-called Sadi Name or Bustan, probably composed in the 1250s, and finally completed in 1257, and the Golestan or Rose Garden, uh, also composed during the same during the same decade. Um, the focus of my book, as I mentioned, are, are Sadi's lyric poems or ghazals, which surprisingly have been celebrated for centuries by, by, uh, by almost all major um, scholars in the Persian speaking world. And until the 19th century, Sadi was a, was a major figure in the Western uh, understanding of, of the literary heritage of, of Iran. Um, but his ghazals have never really reached uh, the, the, um, the level of conversations that one would expect from such a major port. So while today 
uh, most learned uh, Western readers have surely heard about Rumi or Hafez or of course, Ferdowsi. Sadi's poetry is still something that um, escapes the attention of, of, of scholarly conversations. Uh, and, and that's why I decided to write a book about this. I, 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 I've been reading multiple times the roughly 700 Ghazals that are found in his three plus one, I can talk about this, collections of poems, the Divans uh, by Sadi. Uh, they were composed, I also tried to date um, the, the different collections and when they were likely put together, even though this is still a, a debatable topic. Um, so we know for sure that there was this first corpus collected around the 1250s called the Tagivat or the Delights, then the Marvels or Badaye in the 60s of the same century, and finally the final seals of the Chavati in the 12th 70s. What I've tried to also to study is the uh, relationship between the serious love amatory poetry that is found in terms of topics, in terms of themes that is found in Sadi's Ghazals and the obscene works, as well as the praise poem. So I've tried to also to, to contextualize the, uh, the lyric production that was, was produced by this poet within the rather larger framework of his, of his other works in different kinds of registers and different styles and different genres. So to, to see how his lyric voice could interact in multiple levels with the plurality of, of um, overarching themes and, and ideals. It's important to keep track of the patrons who, who, uh, for whom Sadi would write, at the, at whose courts he would, uh, he would flourish, he flourished. Uh, so the, mainly the Salhuri dynasty, uh, the so-called Atabegan Atabegan Fars, and after uh, 1260, the Juvani family, who were the most important Mongol, Persian-speaking Mongol notables of the time. Uh, we can also include the several, several Shirazi religious scholars and a, a network of intellectual and intellectuals and, and poets, such as Majdi Hamgar, Fakhradine Sfahani, uh, other Ilkhanid Sufi poets, Seyfi Farhani and Humame, Humame Tabrizi will be also talking briefly about the influence of Sadi in this sort of later Ilkhanid uh, poets. Um, as you can see, I'm showing some of the main, the highlights in terms of manuscript tradition on which I've been relying to, to also to, to, to focus on specific details that can be interesting for our conversation. One of, one of which is this extremely important manuscript that's never been really studied, has never been used for any, any scholarly uh, work on Sadi, and it has never been used for any of the extant um, editions, critical editions of Sadi's works. The, the, the problem, we do have a plethora of manuscripts uh, containing the majority of Sadi's works, uh, but the problem is that we are still we still need to to look even more carefully about this manuscript tradition because the the critical editions that are found in today's market need to be reconsidered. and And I've tried in my book to to reread the Ghazals in light of 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 the evidence that emerges from these manuscripts and and this extremely important manuscript. That I'm referring to here is it, it comes from the private collection of King Muhammad Zahir Shah. So from his personal library collection, he was copied in uh, so the King of Afghanistan, the previous King of Afghanistan. So the national today is kept in the National Archives of Afghanistan. He was copied in 1325 CE. Uh, so extremely important because it's it's one of the oldest documents. Uh, and you can see here how in the cartouche in the top. Uh, of, of this folio, the Sadi is referred to as Maleko Shuara, the king of the poets or poet laureate. It, this title appears in, uh, in another important manuscript, even earlier than this, copied in 1306 CE by certain Banakati, who was a historian and also a poet. And he was active at the court of, uh, of the of the of Ilkhanid, um, Ilkhanid ruler uh, Ghazan. So you can see here Malek Shara is also used as a 
is a way, is a title. We, we can have a conversation about why Malika Shora was used this and what this title, what this epithet tells us about the connection between Sadi and the, and the courtly circles of his time, especially from the political point of view of his, of his poetic endeavors. In this book, I've tried to uh, address some of the main prejudices and biases that surround our modern reception of Sadi's poetry. Usually Sadi, and I'm glad that I attended uh, Dr. Milani's talk yesterday in Chicago, and, 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 and Dr. Milani addressed the fact that Sadi is usually perceived as a, as a, as a poet who focuses exclusively on ethical and didactic dimensions. It is true. The ethical discourse is one among many other dimensions, uh, but this is part of a general project in which the poet endeavored to, 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 to look for, for to quest for a golden mean as a nuanced balance between modernity and spirituality, also as tools that were put at the service of um, good government. Um, the distance from political power, part, this is something that has also occupied and preoccupied generations of scholars and readers. Sadi did uh, offer and sought actively, actually, the favor of rulers of patrons, patrons throughout his entire life, uh, especially when courting the, uh, the favors of younger princes. And, and I will elaborate on this because I read this with it from the perspective of uh, some kind of ritualized uh, erotic kingship. Um, the heteronormative biases are also very important, very common. Sadi is usually, uh, the, the, the homoerotic dimensions of Sadi is usually repressed or is usually hidden, is not discussed uh, as much as should be. And it's important also to specify that Sadi should not be seen, should not be read through the lens of contemporary um, polarity between or more normative and heteronormative um, standards. Sadi's homoeroticism is a kind of a functional homoeroticism that relates to ritualized ideals of kingship and sacred forms of eroticism. So we are completely far from the idea of, of, of uh, homosexuality in the modern Western, modern Western terms. Uh, Sadi is often, often portrayed as a primarily mystical poet or as an exclusively erotic poet. I try to bridge the gap between these two tendencies. Uh, and I also try to show how important um, philosophy, philosophical thought filtered through Sufi thought was in the development of Sadi's lyric voice. This is something that is usually dismissed mainly because Sadi wrote only one specific technical treatise on, 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 on Sufism uh, with very strong philosophical uh, influences, but at the same time, his style is so plain, so smooth. It's famous for the so-called Sahte Montane, or inimitable smoothness, that when reading his poetry, is the, the, the temptation is to think that there is absolutely no thought, there is no philosophical thought behind behind the um, behind the, 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 the lyric production of this of this poet. So I will. Um, I have um, the book, which is here, uh, can be divided into three different parts, and each part can be read as a semi-independent study. So it's 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 um, it's divided according to the a, a sort of a medieval anthropological approach. So the first part focuses on the body. The second part focuses on the soul, and the third part focuses on the enactment of the relationship between the body and the soul. So the first part, which is titled Uncovering the Skin of the Gazelle, deals with the more secular, mundane, uh, physical aspects of, of Sadi's poetry. So the, the, the histori historiographical uh, understanding we can have of, this, of his works, his connection with his patrons. Uh, I try to rewrite completely uh, his, the facts of his life. You know, as far as, I, as as much as I could, and and I've been focusing also on on uh, his non the non spiritual aspect of his of his lyricism, uh, and I'm showing here another manuscript, extremely beautiful, uh, kept in uh, in the uh, Bibliothèque Nationale de France, uh, BNF. Uh, it was copied in 1461, so it was a late Timurid uh, manuscript uh, by um, Abdallah Hirabi. 
uh, also known as uh, Tabach. Um, this is this is a beauty. You can see that this is, this is Nasr calligraphy. It's finest. Uh, it is finest example. And and um, this is a specific poem of praise dedicated to a young minister of Ilkhani finances. His name was Shamsadin Joveni. You can see here on the on the top right of the folio, Mahde Khaje Shamsadin Sahib Divan. Sahib Divan was his title. You can see the, the kind of the kind of uh, discourse that he enacts when praising such political figures. May God be exalted for converting vulgar liquids into a marvelous painting. Your splendid countenance, your eyes, your hair, your forehead. No description can honor what the gaze sees in you. To what end should I describe you? Look at yourself in the mirror. Since God molded Adam's clay and painted humankind, he has from mud extracted no semen as splendid as your origin. You do not belong to Adam's progeny, as in God's paradise, the beauty of the Huris do not, does not reach your perfection. So much do the eyes desire you that the wilderment reigns, as if watching Yusuf, the knife cuts through the hands and the citrons. The lords of gazes, Ahle Nazar, cannot but marvel in silence, as praise cannot embrace your limitless beauty. No room in my mouth for the lord of your lips, as no mouth, no lips can pronounce the precious treasuries of pearls. And if Ibn Mukla, the calligrapher, should come back to the world, in spite of him claiming as miraculous the manifest magic of his pen, he would not be able to paint in gold an alif similar to your stature, nor, nor would he with molten silver limb the sin of your smile. Especially to see how the, the relationship between the beauty of the human figure and calligraphy is something that um, is found throughout Sadi's works. And I had a very interesting con conversation a few months ago with a dear colleague of mine, Lamia Balafrej, Professor Balafrej, who teaches uh, art history uh, at UCLA. And, and we did uh, reflect on, on the possibility of the role of Sadi in the development of, of the aesthetics of, of calligraphy and manuscript production throughout the the 14th and 15th centuries, um, especially considering that, as the title of my book suggests, beauty and the observation, the contemplation of beauty can be considered as the main pole, the main focus of the entirety of Sadi's production. So this is why I, I try to, to show to colleagues and readers that it is necessary now to transition from a perspective that is predominantly ethical on Sadi to a perspective that take, takes into account the relevance of his aesthetic discourse, his celebration of beauty. Um, the second chapter is movements and gaze in the Rose Garden. I try to reframe the importance of this poetry within the context of his major prose and verse work, the Golestan of the Rose Garden. I try to see how biographical experiences, political engagement, and some sort of fictive sensuality, um, what, what role they play into the emergence of Sadi's own lyric voice. Um, this is another, this is also another folio from the, the, the manuscript that is kept in, uh, in Tashkent. Um, here you can see how in the introduction, I focused a lot on the introduction of the Golistan. And introductions, unfortunately, are the parts of the book. This is what I tell my students all the time that we usually dismiss and we don't really take into account very seriously. And I try to analyze quite finally every 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 single passage that could open new windows in our understanding of of Sadi's poetry. In this in this case, I was interested in seeing the connection between Sadi and the young prince Saad, son of uh, Abu Bakr. So you can see that Mate Atabege, Saad ben Abi Bakr, ben ben Saad. So we have Saad the first, who was the very first, one of the most important rulers in uh, in the very first um, decades of of the 13th century in Shiraz. He was succeeded uh, succeeded by by Abu Bakr, and then his prince ruled only for a few days. Um, Saad Saad the second, and I think that this Saad, this specific Saad here. Who was who was a teenager when Sadi returned to Shiraz, uh, sometime in the in the forties, early forties, is is the person who bestowed upon Sadi his tachalos or pen name, so Sadi 
derives most likely uh, from Saad II, this young prince. And it's interesting how in the scholarship, this is not really emphasized. And when this specific passage is found and is read, is commented upon in the critical editions that are found in the market, this Saad is not really read as the main recipient, as the main interlocutor of Sadis, of, of the Golistan. Uh, and it's interesting that here we can see um, is describing how the book was composed. And so this is Vataman, Vataman on Gashavad, Beharigat, he Pasandide, Pasandide Oyad, Dar Bargohe, Shohe, Johan Penah, Vasoye, Parvar de Garo, Partobe, Lotfe, Kerdegar. If it's interesting, toward the end of the series of titles that appear here after the mention of the name of Sad, Prince Sad, Sadi says, the book will be will end will be completed. So the act of reading, the prince reading the book, partakes in the action of composing the book itself. So, uh, so I'm trying to see how the special um, formulaic, homoerotic, almost social connection between Sadi and Prince Sad animates some of the aesthetic components of of the Golestan. Um, and then the third chapter of this part is, is, is something that has also been has been has been suppressed, uh, has not been really studied with the kind of scholarly uh, dedication that it, it requires. Is the obscene aspect? I've tried to see how the obscene in Sadi's poetry can can his hadisat or hasl uh, can be read as a countertext of his more serious production, and to see how Sadi is not. Um, subversive through this kind of obscene lines because of their content, because of, of because of the excesses that sometimes they represent and they portray, but because he does reflect a, a, a tradition, a Persian tradition of, of, of porno, literary pornography, but he adds an element of literary elegance to it, which is can be witnessed in, in this, that you have the Persian original text from the, from the Kabul manuscript, and he says, how beautiful it is to offer one's heart to a beloved, a moon-faced beauty so graciously noble and elegant, his delicate feet wearing many sandals, manly, manly sandals on his head, a coarse hat in the fashion of muleteers, a beardless boy whose chest is wrapped in a woolen cloth, is much more handsome than a girl covered by the veil. Girls need gold, fine garments and ornaments to entice the passion of their husbands, Many ornaments are needed to beautify their bodies. A masky mole, a fine and dark downy beard won't suffice. The brides of paradise cover their head with veils. I love hemp garments on a beauty's chest. Better than me, no one can describe how the tunic closes and opens from behind the neck. When a boy lays his silver chin on the ground, the bed is an ornament in full display. Commonly, young men, shahed, are all that a city needs, no more than one sun out to shine upon a country. The kings sleep on verandas, manzar, that overlook beautiful vistas. The verandas of the, the veranda of the mystics, Arifan, is the back of a beautiful boy. I'm interested in the way that Sadi brings in the a discourse on, on spirituality. And he makes use of technical words like shahed and arif in this kind of in this kind of uh, porn pornographic output to offer us a different point of view. On the connection between the soul and the body, between the idealized celebration of beauty and the more um, naturalistic, almost uh, rougher, uh, more um, mundane ways of, of talking about the body from, from a different point of view. And this is why I, um, I endeavor to show the entanglements between eroticism, politics, and mysticism or spirituality or Sufism. And this is an interesting manuscript from the early uh, um, 14th century. It collects the works of a famous poet, Roman de Tabrizi, who was also uh, active at the court of the Giovanni family. And here in this very specific manuscript, we can see how Sadi influenced the connection between eroticism and power and mysticism in the relationship between Khomeini Tabrizi, Tabrizi and Ilkhanid, Ilkhanid ruler. So there is this beautiful, these beautiful lines that open a long qasida that Sadi wrote 
sometime in the in the in the sixties, in the in the twelve sixties, to celebrate the beauty of the army of the the beauty of the Mongol army uh, in Shiraz when he was paying homage to the Ilkhani dynasty ruling over Fars at this point. Um, and and it's interesting to see how uh, Ghazan, late Ilkhanid ruler, one of the first rulers also who converted to Islam with the name of uh, Mahmud, asked, he heard Sadi's poem and asked Muhammad Tabrizi to craft a response that blends here visions of paradise with the with mundane um, uh, power. So you can see here that he, in here, here uh, Homam imagines the be these beauties that make up the, the Ilkhanid army uh, as beautiful boys from paradise who are descending upon earth to, to kiss the threshold of the Ilkhan of our time, Ghazan, the king of the world. And this opens a whole debate on the controversy on the mystical or mundane nature of Sadi's lyric poems. We heard this all the time. Is Sadi's poetry mystical? Is it pu purely mundane um, and exclusively erotic? It is important to remember that the oldest manuscripts that collect Sadi's works attest to the circulation of Sadi's poetry among communities of readers that belong to both Sufi and courtly cultural networks. Sufism and uh, courtly mundanity are extremely important. They are part of the same framework in this context. And it's also, but it's, I discovered that this, this manuscript that has been studied in the past, but for some reason, this specific folio was never really analyzed um, by anyone else. And, and there is this specific description of how and when Sadi's Sufi Lodge was built probably in 1281 or 1282 through Shamsuddin Jobeni again, and for how much money, also how much was invested, and where in the outskirts of Shiraz in an area known as Fahandar or Fahen, Fahandez. The, the manuscript here says Fahandar, like coming from Pahandar. Uh, it's possible that it is a, a mistake in the transcription in the, in the copy, of the copies. It could be Fahan or Pahandez or Kohan Pahandez. Um, so this is an important document to understand better that Sadi was actually active and did have a Sufi lodge that he was, where his own poetry was performed during the uh, so-called uh, uh, mystical concerts or Sama rituals. Um, and here we get to the part two, which is the central part of the book. I'll try to be as, as brief and concise as possible. Um, through the mirror of your glances. Here, after having explored the mundane, material, physical aspect of Sadi's poetry, I try to show the complexity of, of his, uh, of the sacred aesthetics that, 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 that um, determine the development of his lyric, the development of his lyric subject. It's divided into two sub uh, parts. That, so the first two chapters separated by an interlude and then two other chapters. Um, I can show you why I did this. And the second part, in the second part, which is chapter four and five, the body is a divine sign, their meaning of spiritual desire. And chapter five, the uh, RF as a beholder, the divine pen depicting the hat of the beloved. Uh, through these chapters, I try to frame the spiritual aspect of Sadi's act of contemplating human beauty through different, two different modalities. There is one rational inferential modality Keywords such as ebrat, tafakur, ta'amol belong to this modality. And there is a second modality that I call imaginal cosmological that has to do with alam ghayb, loe mahfuz, and so on. So I, the first two chapters deal with the, this first modality. There is one chapter, chapter number six, on uh, medieval Abyssinian cognition and psychology. And the second, Part the, the the two uh, the chap chapter seven and eight focus on this imaginal cosmological modality. The rational inferential modality relates to the question of how does the human beloved, the mashu in Sadi's poetry, reflect divine beauty? Is the beloved an incarnation of God? Does he iconically signal God's ineffable presence? How can we reassess the problem of the vision of God in the context of Sadi's poetry? Because it's clear that the beloved is not God. This is, this is a mistake that many commentators make still today. 
there's this 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 strange confusion that which is a theologically problematic even of seeing the mashuk as god the mashuk is never actually god but can be represented as a reflection as a physical reflection of divine beauty and and sadi meditates on this problem he says you appear in the morning and no one bows down to worship your face why people fear god whereas i am too bewildered to prostrate on the page like cheek of the beautiful ones, they see the downy beard, the hat, the beard of the beloved. Short is their sight, but the beholder, the RF, contemplates the pen of God's creation. They, I call it rational inferential because the beloved, the human beloved is, is an inference, it's a sign, it's a semiotic system that points to the, the beauty of God, but it's not actually God. So there is, I try through chapters four and five to make sense of the rational aspect of this spiritual semiotic system and how Sadi deals with that. Um, the second modality has to do with the problem of the unseen. Sadi does talk about the ghaib, olam ghaib, in many, on many occasions. And, and uh, I remember when I was a student also, I often asked myself, what is this ghaib? What is the ghaib? What is the, the world of the unseen? What is this invisible world? Look, for instance, about this, this ghazal, this very short ghazal. Behold, someone is coming from the garden of paradise, a star is crossing the sky, or maybe an angel is coming. As sweet beauties appear from the world of the unseen, salt of passion opens wounds in the hearts of the dear companions. One breath abandons my life and one more breath comes back so that for one breath, the intimacy with the beloved is bestowed upon me. O Sadi, the sorrow of loving him is a sultan and his army shall seize the kingdom of your life. His night watch is coming. This um, the problem of the contemplation of the invisible world relates to the to the question of the preserved tablet, which is a Quranic term, Lah Mahfuz, Loh Mahfuz, modern Persian, the matrix of the book, or as I try to demonstrate in Abyssinian cosmological terms, according to the cosmological system of Ibn Sina, which influenced deeply the, the entirety of the cultural cir circles in which Sadi was flourishing between Baghdad and Shiraz uh, during uh, the second half of the 13th century, called the soul of the fixed stars of the active intellect. The body, along with its carnal passions and external perceptions, veils the heart and prevents it from visualizing the supernal realm of the unseen. So we're still talking about the act of beholding beauty, but this is a kind of contemplation that is metaphysical and involves the body of the beholder. And it's interesting how I've been comparing also different Sufi treatises and, and philosophical works to show how material this experience is and how important it is for us to focus on the on the physiological aspects of the techniques that are involved in the practice of the Sufis to visualize the Olam uh, Dreams, for instance, are something that is usually described and I've been working mainly on a, a treatise in Persian called Kimya Sadat, the Alchemy of Bliss by Imam Al-Ghazali who died in 1111 and was also heavily influenced by uh, Abyssinian philosophy, spiritual training, yazat, observation of the sacred law, repetition of formula leading to the obfuscations of external perceptions, sensory deprivation, renunciation, sama, which is a ritualized exposure to musical lyric poetry leading to ecstatic states. The teleological contemplation of the world, so looking at the beauty of the goal, contemplating beauty, contemplating erotically also the beauty of the human forms to obtain a taste, the, Velt or Zog of, of the invisible. So I tried with these this two final chapters of the second part of my book to make sense of this. And the bridge between these two modalities is held together by the sixth chapter, 
in which I explore the internal the role of the internal sense in the rational soul of Avicennian um, origin to trace the psychology of the living psychology. Of course, when I say psychology, I refer to medieval psychology, which is the study of the soul and study of cognition and perception, the connection with the cosmological realm in which, which cognition takes place. See, look at these lines. So pervasive is the depiction of the beloved in my imagination that no intelligibles are any longer depicted in my mind. Everyone, everyone's mind imagines someone's beautiful face, but the one I imagine is beyond imagination. And then from the aperture of my thinking, my heart showed to the rational soul, the signs of my desperation. And I've been uh, relying heavily on this system, right? the, the, the way that in the Abyssinian tradition, models of cognition rotate around the complexity of the imagination, how five different internal senses interact with the external senses, and for spiritual purposes, they can interact with the world, of the, the invisible world, which is the matrix of creation. And, and this is what the Sufi on the path strives to, to acquire as an ecstatic and ecstatic experience. So I try to shift. The question for me is not what is the nature of the beloved. I don't, I don't, I, the problem is not to determine whether the beloved is real, whether the beloved corresponds to God, whether the beloved is God or not. The problem for me is how does the lyric subject think? How does the lyric subject, the Oshe in Sadi's poetry, perceive and cognize the world and the visual imagined presence of the beloved in the context of a mental contact with the unseen? So we shift from spiritual hermeneutics to a psychophysiological model of cognition. Overall, how can we account for the relationship between the descriptions of visual experiences, tangible visual encounters, dreams, and imagined ideals of beauty, which are all found in the entirety of Sadi's corpus? And his ghazals somehow are the most perfect, the most uh, clear example of the complexity of these entanglements between the experience, the physical experience of the world the imagination, dreams, and, and the, the, the quest for a supernal uh, ideal of beauty. Uh, and I will close with these lines. So this says, everyone seeks some, something and desires someone, whereas we covet no other desires but you. Through the mirror of my imaginings, no other forms and limbs will be ever be depicted as beautiful as you are. And this is the actual final, the, the final Ghazal. You left, but you still linger in my imagination. It seems that you are being depicted before my eyes. Okay, I show in this uh, Ghazal how the technical terms of Avicennian theory of cognition is at work in a very specific way in Sadi's poetry. My cogitations cannot reach the apogee of your beauty, as you are more beautiful than anything my imagination ever conjured. The moon never walked on earth, no eyes ever apprehended a fairy. How can I think of you as a fairy, of your face as a moon? You're an angel indeed, for you were not conceived from this clay. Humans are made of water and earth, you from pure musk, musk and armor grease. Too much weeping for you may ruin my eyes, but who cares? You are more precious than the eyes that are lodged in my sockets. Sadi, as your hands cannot reach the encounter with the beloved, for once you shall dedicate your time to remembering him. And I conclude this presentation with just a mention of part three of the book. We don't have time to go through this, in which I focus on the lyrical ritual somehow and the performance and performative space of sacred eroticism. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor, for a wonderful talk. We have lots of questions and comments, so I'm going to try to get to a few of them quickly. Um, to start with, just a few quick questions about the book itself. A viewer is asking if the book contains the original Persian poems, and if the pages of the manuscript you showed in your presentation are also in the book. Yes, thank you for this question. Yes, I have a large appendix with all, where all the original texts are, are presented, and it's easy to flip back and forth between the English translations and the original text. I attempted to also to reconstruct them um, by taking a look at the manuscripts. So it is my own critical edition of these specific poems that I uh, analyze. 
and uh, what was the uh, yes and the manuscripts are all described uh, they're all listed and described one by one and I, I do refer to the actual folder so some of these manuscripts are available online so it's it's you know it's it's, it's also an invitation for other scholars to, 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 to collaborate to and contribute to this field great thank you a uh, viewer asks, could you set, shed some light on why Saadi has been known as a Sufi or Arif in the subcontinent, his name showing up in many Chisti hagiographies as one of the sheikhs, while in Iran he had been known only as a poet and ethicist? He was known for both, and it depends on, on, um, it depends on the circles of transmissions. So it is clear that, that in, 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 13th, in 14th century Iran, Saadi was known as a, as a Shaire Aref, nothing is Aref Shaire, which is an important distinction. A poet who had spiritual endeavors, not a mystic who would also compose poetry. This is a very important distinction. Uh, and in my book, I also try to show how important was the circulation of his poetry uh, during the second half of the 13th century in the Delhi Sultanate through the Sorabardia order. So that's why that I talk about a loose connection with the sort of idea order and how in the subcontinent, Sadi very early on, he was even invited to Delhi um, to, 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 to join the, the, um, the court and the connection between, or between, between the sultans in that, in that city and the, and the poetic and spiritual activities that were taking place. And that's why that he's renowned crystallized in that way. Whereas in Iran, um, he, he became a monument soon after the, 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 the 14th, 15th centuries. And so, it is clear that in the way that it was approached and reread, Jami, for instance, called Sadi the very first lyric poet, the very poet who formalizes the Ghazal. Uh, and, and subsequent tradition lost track of, of the importance of the spiritual aspect. And works such as the Golestan became much more important and commented upon, especially during the Ottoman and Safavid periods, and, um, rather than his, his actual lyric poetry. Thank you. There are many comments from viewers thanking you for your work and your presentation and looking forward to reading the book. One viewer writes, thank you for an excellent presentation. Um, I am in awe of the depth of your research. As a Persian, I would like to express my gratitude to you for offering this cultural gift to our community. I am interested to know about the first impulse that took you on this path. And another viewer also asked, what attracted you to Saadi Shirazi? The, it, it, the the beauty of the poetry. I mean, I I I, I remember I was my teachers in Naples in uh, in uh, the Oriental Institute in Naples taught me that Sadi is is a wonderful tool to learn Persian as a language, but he's he's a moralist and there's nothing really interesting about him, and his ghazals were never even mentioned when I was studying Hafez Rumi in Persian, and, and I wrote my dissertation on on Obed uh on his serious poetry, but I never really was interested in, in Sadi's Ghazals. And then by chance, when I was living in Tehran, I started reading his Ghazals and, and I was fascinated by, by the complexity and the beauty and, and this actual inimitable style. And in, 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 um, inimitable smoothness means that even when we try to translate Sadi's poetry, and I apologize for the, um, the unpolished nature of my translations, which I consider as a, constant work in progress. And, and um, I do believe that Saadi is by far the most untranslatable of all poets, more than Hafez, because of the crystal clear transparency of, of, his, of his style. So this is the main, this was the main factor that attracted me initially. So to crack the secret of this beauty. Thank you. Another viewer, thanks for your part. Thanks you for your presentation and writes, the good governance dimension of Saadi poetry that you mentioned at the start of the talk was very interesting. Do the Mongol conquests figure into Saadi's poetry in the context of that dimension? It is, and I do analyze um, the role that the Atabekane farce played in, uh, in conquering Baghdad and helping the, Mongol, the Mongols uh, invade that city and establishing their power in Iran. And I also analyze Saadi's attempt to, to get, offer guidance to this princess. And so he knew what kind of major disaster could have fallen upon Shiraz. And that's why Shiraz was never really, was never really fully conquered. He was never really destroyed. So the destiny of Shiraz, I think that Saadi's presence to some extent saved 
the city of Shiraz and Fars from the Mongol threat. I, can, I, I go this far in my book and I try to demonstrate in what specific key historical moments that his presence was, was, was relevant for, for this, this historiographical uh, approach. Thank you. Another viewer writes, could you maybe expand a bit on the reasons why reading the beloved as an image of God is actually theologically problematic? It's problematic because um, the, there is, a, there is a, a term that is hulul or incarnationism that is something that cannot ever be considered as acceptable from a theological point of view. Two souls, two spirits cannot inhabit one single body. And God is by definition one, and the oneness of God cannot be uh, diffracted or deconstructed through imagining his presence in one body. So the, the metaphor that is usually um, explored in this kind of poetry is the metaphor of the mirror. So if we look at the mirror, we see an image, but it does not mean that the mirror possesses that image. It's just something that shines upon briefly on the surface and is, is, is not even identical, does not, co does not coincide with the origin of that beauty. So this is why, and it's, 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 it's interesting that still in sort of the pseudo mystical readings of many of, of 14th century and 15th century uh, Persian poems, we still read this idea that the beloved is God, but this is absolutely an absurd from a theological point of view, mainly. Thank you. Uh, just a clarification question. One viewer asks, what is the actual name of Sadi versus his title? And another viewer asks, is there any evidence that Sadi and Rumi knew each other? Uh, evidence of Sadi and Rumi meeting each other, there is no real evidence for this. There are veiled references to each other that need to be explored. And uh, it's not, it's not, um, Unlike, I, I, I read Sadi and Rumi as two completely different poets who probably knew about each other and embraced the discourse, the metaphysical discourse in different ways. And it's possible that, that the references to their connection still lack real, real investigation. So it's something we need to, the main, one of the most interesting approaches to this would be to analyze the so-called response poems and to see how Sadi might have responded to Rumi and vice versa. And I do this in parts of my book in which I try to show the difference between these two poets through these comparisons where the form is the same, the, 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 the rhyme is the same, the meter is also the same, and um, but there are completely different ways of approaching the act of contemplating beauty for spiritual ends. As far as the name, it's still debatable. It's still, it's still the problem of the name of Sadi what I try to establish on the basis of, on, on the, basis of the sources is, is explained page 10 from my book and Musharif ad Musli. This is what I, this is what I um, adopt, but I, in the footnotes, I try to point at the whole problematic of, of, of stemming from this definition. And, and uh, it's, 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 it's something that probably we will never know about and probably, but Musharif ad Musli seems to be what most of the oldest sources agree upon. Thank you. Um, a couple similar questions. Is the homosexuality in Sadi's writings comparable to ancient Greek eroticism? And in which epoch in Middle Ages or modernity of Muslim power um, and Persian literature did erotic poetry begin to see itself as immoral and as an unforgiven sin? This is, yeah, this is an interesting issue. Um, I addressed this in the in the first two chapters of my book. Um, the ideal, it, well, it's I would not call this homosexuality, because homosexuality is a concept that the way we frame it is is related mostly to identity in the Western world, in the Western sort of discourse on on same sex um, uh, desires and 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 relationships. Uh, I would refer to this as homosexuality same-sex eroticism or homoeroticism in general. And it's usually intergenerational. And uh, Sadi has different opinions about this. And it's interesting to see how he frames different ethical stands according to the framework and the genres in which he's writing. 
Um, and then I prefer not to respond to the second part of this question because it's, 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 it deserves a whole lecture, but there, there is, the, it is a topic that has been discussed and Professor Catherine Babayan from the University, University of Michigan, for instance, has been, has been uh, approaching this pro problem from the point of view of the Safavid Iran. And uh, Professor Afsani Najm Abadi has written about this as far as Qajar Iran is concerned. So I've referred to these publications, to these scholars to, to explore this point of view in the modern world. Thank you. Uh, how was Saadi received in the Western part of the Islamic world? He was received. Um, he was he was he was read in the in the throughout the Ottoman in the Ottoman lands. Sadi was extensively studied and and read, and and he was also one of the main sources of inspirations for for generations of, of scholars and and poets. He was constantly imitated and reread. So, uh, he Sadi, of course, this kind of trends happen um, within the framework of, of, of the Persianate world. So any cultural regions that were deeply influenced by, by the Persian language and culture, between the, even as far as the Balkans, you know, to go westward as far as, as, uh, as, as the Indian Ocean and, um, and even Southeast Asia, uh, Sadi was circulated. So as long as Persian was a cultural presence, uh, Sadi was there, absolutely. Thank you. On that note of his reach, we actually have a comment from a viewer who says, I'm from Tanz Tanzania and we have African Shiraz communities. Do you know any stories of how Shirazis carried Sadi's poetry to Africa and of Sadi's poetry in Swahili? And also a comment from another viewer who says, many thanks for your informative presentation. I'm from India. <clears throat> Was Sadi Shirazi also represented in Indian traditions in of Persia? This is with these questions we're pushing the boundaries of my <laughs> comfort zone, and and they're brilliant questions. Uh, I wish I could respond, but this is an open field, and I'm particularly interested in in uh, um, uh, the, the the influence of Persian culture in African studies and the African manuscript tradition. And it's clear that, uh, especially in the island of Zanzibar, which has a, most likely a, a, a Persian orig origin. Um, the name itself uh, was uh, heavily influenced by the presence of Shirazi traders. Um, I'm interested in um, in the in the introduction. I try to show also how important the 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 Salguri the presence in the Indian Ocean and in Persian Gulf was uh, for the dissemination of Sadi's poetry. So the, the, for a couple of decades, the Salgurids were ruling Fars and Shiraz, but also the entire, almost the entirety of the, of the Persian Gulfs and parts of the Western part of the Indian Ocean, uh, up to Gujarat in some ports. And, and in some cases, the, 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 the Friday mosques in these uh, this coastal communities would, would, would read the khutbah in the name of uh, Abu Bakr, uh, uh, so who was Sadi's first patron. And, and, and I'm absolutely sure that this contributed to the circulation of, of Sadi's poetry in this broader uh, coastal areas. Thank you. Um, one viewer writes, you made a point that Sadi was more of a poet who had musical leanings and not as a mystic who wrote poetry. Could you expand on this more? Um, yes, I because Sadi never embraces one system of Sufi values as a scholastic framework. He never specifies what kind of Sufi order he belonged to. I did recognize connections with the Suravardia and the power that the Suravardia, especially as far as the Futuwa was on the Javan Mardi in Persian was, was uh, influential in Baghdad and Shiraz during those decades. But he, 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 he cannot, be, and in this I agree partially with what Professor Milani says when he says that Sadi has nothing to do with Sufism, it has nothing to do with the, with the more scholastic aspects of Sufism. He embraces Sufi aesthetics and Sufi ideals in ways that were functional for his ethical and aesthetic um, endeavors throughout his poetry, throughout the composition of his poetry. Thank you. In your opinion, what is the most unique or most outstanding aspect of Saadi? 
uh, the, 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 the transparent perfection of his style in poetry. I think so. I think this is, this is something that it's, 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 uh, it's bewildering. It's bewildering because, because uh, for instance, there is one specific uh, um, rhetorical device called genocetum, which we can translate almost in English as paranomasia, paranomasia, which is the repetition of a word in the same line with a slight shift in meaning. So I, I say the same words twice and the second instance means something different within, within the same line. And it create, generates um, a very smooth, almost invisible progression of meaning. And we don't really see the repetition. We don't see, so it is, so it is a master of this, of this kind of minimalism. So that's what really inspires me the most. Thank you so much, Professor. We're just at time. There were many more questions and comments, many thanking you for your presentation and your work. Um, just a reminder that in the chat, there is a link to the book with a, a generous discount from the publisher if you're looking to purchase the book. Um, we hope the next time we see you, it will be at Stanford. Congratulations on the book. Um, and we hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you very much, Roma. Thank you very much, Frank, also for, for uh, taking care of the logistics of this encounter. Thank you, Professor. Um, Ostad Abbas Milani, and thank you to the to the center, the Iranian Studies in Stanford. It was it was an absolute pleasure.